for example, in the past few years, is that we've been mobilizing each other, our members, 50 members throughout the different countries in the manner that our organizations work on women's rights to campaign, to uh, show solidarity, but also to kind of protect each other by uh, uh, breaking the isolation that the governments and states of the MENA in the past few years have been setting up to target uh, def the defenders. So what I mean by that is, for example, if you want to take a look at, um, uh, for example, uh, Egypt. And, uh, you know, we've been learning a lot from uh, our colleagues and feminist comrades in Egypt that there's been a lot of counter work to sexual harassment and sexual violence publicly, right? So what happens is that the state or the society in its uh, patriarchal, um, uh, you know, tools uh, corner and target these like women or these defenders. So what happens is that we mobilize the whole region to stand up for these individuals. And by doing so, we're not just practicing solidarity that, you know, is just a campaign online. What we're doing is we're putting out a discourse that say, actually what this person in Egypt does is not new. She's not crazy. She's not, it's not the only one who, who's doing it. This is what feminists do around the MENA. By doing so, I think we offer some sort, not only a, some sort of a protection to each other, but we also kind of visibilize these discourses that the states, especially in the MENA, in the past few years have been really, really working so systematically to make them sound as if they were inferior or Western or not important. So in that sense, this is what we've uh, been doing. I'm just trying to talk about this in, in line of what was asked that we uh, talk about. So this, this has been like our experiences in the MENA. We've been also doing a lot of advocacy on the behalf of certain WHRDs uh, as requested. We've been covering our colleagues and uh, comrades in Sudan. Things there have been really intense and we've been uh, doing uh, offering communication as much as we can. <clears throat> To, uh, uh, to get support to the grave uh, uh, attacks that the WHRDs in Sudan are witnessing. But also another thing what we do at the coalition, and I think it's very important that other organizations also do, is that we have a registrar that actually uh, reports and compiles incidents and analyzes them and understands the patterns of violations that happen against WHRDs in the region because this is how we base our protection, advocacy, knowledge, and organizing on. I'm just gonna give a quick example of what our registrar called this year, and we put it out in an infographic on our website. So we know for sure that legally, the states in the, in the MENA have been uh, cornering feminists and WHRDs through offering or forcing them to com comply into a very weird, very oppressive, very, not free uh, um, legal uh, NGO laws. So this is in Egypt, in Jordan, this is everywhere. So because of these laws uh, that really kind of restricts the work of feminist organizations, human rights organizations, civil society, what happens is that the, the organizations are exhausted, are weak, but also it means that they're fully targeted. They're like, you know, they're impacted. So if we look at the pattern of violations in the past two years, specifically also because of COVID, we will realize that the pattern have shifted from targeting organizations to targeting individuals. In 2021 alone, unfortunately, we have lost five women human rights defenders from Iraq by association. These were women uh, doing legal work, so societal work, humanitarian work, specifically supporting other women or being loud about women's participation in elections and take corruption, this is grave. This year alone, we have compiled 60, 60 attacks on WHRDs that are individuals, which means that the governments are less interested in the organizations because in the past few years, they've already targeted them, they restricted them. Now the focus is on the individuals because this is the module of activism that is spread in the MENA, right? Because if as an organization, we can't really move freely, we become individuals and we become more swift and louder. So I'm saying this to also understand that this is also what we need to be organizing for. So we have to understand that 
how states work, how patriarchal institutions work, if they keep on targeting until, you know, the last seed of resisting back is gone. So we have to understand that this in this upcoming year, we realize that the pattern is shifting towards individual attacks, that there's a lot of smearing, a lot of, um, um, you know, a lot of false accusation, you know, like you, in Sudan, for example, one a prominent uh Union person, WHRD, that was uh, arrested and forcibly, forcibly disappeared, was accused of uh, of uh, having drugs. But then she was released because, of course, there were no drugs. But th- the idea is that, that her reputation now <laughs> becomes associated with being arrested for, you know. So this is very important. And it requires us as human rights and as feminist organizations to really consciously and intentionally uh, regroup ourselves locally to do more coordination, to do more analysis, but to also understand that we need to put more content and more discourse that kind of uh, uh, helps everyone understand the kind of fight we are up against in terms of uh, women's rights, equality, and uh, uh, the protection of women human rights defenders. I have a couple of points, but I guess I'll wait till my uh, colleagues also, I hear from them, and then maybe we can share uh, some other points or information about about this. Thank you for so much for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah, for your intervention. Apparently, I was told that we had a technical problem in the live streaming, so it didn't start when I started talking. So I would have to quickly reintroduce the the event and the speakers in a really quick way. So um, again, welcome our panelists, beautiful, strong women today. Um, And also welcome to whoever is watching us on YouTube. Um, Today we are, we have organized this event to mark the International Women Day. And the aim of this event was to uh, reflect uh, and discuss how women uh, progress and development uh, affects a society. And uh, we wanted to share all together uh, different experiences about actions taken to support women's rights, the main legal and policy gaps that pre- prevent women from fully obtaining their rights, uh, what are the actions that has been uh, carried out to promote women's rights uh, on, on cultural, societal, uh, national, international levels, and how we can work all together to raise the, fo- or the voice of women human rights defender and to build a community amongst ourselves that enjoys a high level of cohesion and solidarity towards uh, women's issues. And um, we have uh, five speakers from five different organizations. Uh, we have Sara Abogazal. Um, from the Women Human Rights Defenders Coalition, uh, MENA region. And we have Ingrid uh, Rosland from RAPTO Foundation. We have Khuloud Al Khatib from Louder. And uh, we have Christina Rendon uh, from Martin Annals Foundation. And Rayhan Yalsendag uh, Baidemir from uh, the FIDH, the International Federation for Human Rights. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah, for your uh, intervention. And um, it's really uh, true when you said that um, almost after closing all civil space in, in the in the MENA region, uh, mostly, and uh, the target has shifted from um, institutional uh, targets to individual target and uh, that's that's absolutely true thanks thanks for um, highlighting that point uh, now we would move to uh, Ingrid Rosland from Rafto Foundation um, Ingrid the floor is yours thank you Asma and really interesting listening to uh, to Sara uh, thank you for having me uh, I think that uh, now in celebration of also International Women's Day and which is also every day but uh, I think working with women human rights defenders and on women's rights, uh, we have seen some major setbacks to women's rights, uh, such as the pandemic and, and the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan. Uh, but I think despite these major setbacks, there are reasons for hope. And I think we need to cling to this hope. 
Um, yesterday at the Women's March in Oslo, we walked together with the women human rights defenders from Afghanistan who came to Norway recently and continue their work from here. And they are not giving up. They are working together with the civil society in Afghanistan. Uh, and they are not willing to give up on the rights that they have achieved during the past 20 years. And they have a strong movement and they will continue to fight uh, both from within and outside of Afghanistan. Uh, but I also think I want to talk about, because I think there's one major progress that we are seeing that's become evident for the last uh, really 10 years, but I think it's more, it's being adopted more and more. And it's this idea of uh, intersectional feminism. And it has been adopted by so many, and especially in the region that we are working in. Uh, and although it does represent us with tools that exposes and also interprets a multitude of challenges and injustices, which can seem really daunting, it is a huge progress that we are now able to call things out for what they are. Um, and I think only through using this intersectional lens, we can target these injustices and work together. Uh, and I think also looking at the intersectional movement, uh, I think the Western or so-called bourgeois feminism has so much to learn also from the feminist movement that is going on in the rest of the world, where, for example, they include everyone, uh, the LGBTIQ movement and trans rights, which is really, it's strange to see that in West, this is, uh, it's become an issue where trans uh, gender rights are not part of the feminist movement. And it's a big shame. Uh, and the Western movement has a long way to go and has much to learn from the feminist movement that we see in the region that we are working in. Uh, and I also want to just add on what Sara said, because we also see that in the way that we are working now with women human rights offenders, where the civic space is increasing, no, it's, it's, it's being targeted and shrinking. And really, it's there is not much civil space left anymore, and individuals are targeted instead. And this especially goes for women human rights defenders. And this networking, it's so important. The networking that uh, the MENA coalition is doing, the networking we are doing with, uh, from, uh, from the uh, intersectional feminist network that we have, uh, also we are supporting that from RAFTO Foundation for Human Rights. It's so important to come together, to share these ideas and strategies on how to promote women's rights. Uh, and even though we come from different contexts, and, uh, and that is the whole point, to come together, to be strong. Uh, and, uh, and I really want to talk more about that. And, uh, and I think we have so much to learn from each other. And um, I really look forward to hearing uh, the others' uh, speeches and, and engage in discussions around this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ingrid. By the way, Ingrid, uh, started working at Rafto Foundation for Human Rights in 2013 with a special focus on supporting women human rights defenders in the MENA region and Southeast Asia. And now she heads Rafto's Human Rights Defenders Program. And she also continues supporting women human rights defenders through cross-regional networks in MENA and Southeast Asia. Thank you so much, Ingrid, for your input. Um, we will move to Khuloud Al Khatib, who is a human rights defender, lawyer, and university associate professor. She is co founder and the president of the Lebanese Organization for Defending Equality and Rights, Louder. And currently, she is the executive director of the Human Rights Center at the Lebanese International University. In 2018, she was selected as a board director at the Global Institute for Women's Empowerment which is an international liberal think supported by the UN Empower Women Global Mentor. Please go ahead, Khuloud. Hello, hello, Asma. How's everyone? Happy Women's Day for all. I'm so glad to be with these freedom fighters and human rights defenders <laughs> on this day. And, like, and I know like uh, all of us, we do face a stereotype, but this is how we face a stereotype by going, by showing leadership, by getting and deserve the opportunities that we really deserve. And this, like all the region that we face a lot of challenges. So um, yes, I'm Khulud from Lebanon. And I'm happy to say that uh, I'm one of the co-founders of, uh, of an international uh, women rights defenders called Interne Intersectional Feminist Collective, which was founded by RAFTO. And I'm happy to have Ingrid with it here. And we are like a group of defenders working on the MENA region and South Asia actually on, um, on, on like all the issues that we face every day. And if we wanna talk about the region, 
it is true that we have very dark space or very dark phase regarding the closure of the civic space, as Sarah and Ingrid was mentioning, and it is due of many authoritarian regimes that we really have in our countries. And this is like really a closure that is really systematic and systematic in many different means. I mean, if we take, for example, the closure of civic spaces, how much women and human rights defenders are really being, um, being attacked, being under censorship, being uh, at all. We have a lot of defenders today in prison just because of their civic space, because of their civic um, struggle for, for the freedoms and for our dignity. If we can take how much we have faced a lot of pressure during the civic movement and the um, the demonstrations that happen, take for example what happened in Egypt, recently in Sudan, in Iraq, in Lebanon, how much we were attacked only because of this movement, we can see a systematic approach in whole the region. But this approach, although how much systematic, but also at the same time, we can see that women at these demonstrations were front fighters. They were at the top of any of these movements, they strategize, they, they led decisions, they, they, they take the country to what we really, uh, according to our visions. So which means that despite of all the challenges we're facing, we're still there. We have a voice, we have something to say, we collaborate together. Another important challenge that we can see in the region is that the, the legal text, how it is really, how much we have a challenges in the law, but also in the interpretation of the law. Like how many countries do not have law that protects from violence? How many pr countries, for, for example, till now, we do not have protection for their rights? How many countries for now, the application of law have been interpreted against the woman? So when we do have uh, uh, gender gaps in terms of wages, in terms of the working conditions, in terms of the absence of laws that combat violence against women, we, can, we are talking about real challenges. If we take another example regarding the patriarchal community, I mean, we face a lot of challenges where a lot of people, they say that women defenders are destroying value system. I'm a woman def defender that refuses to say I destroy values. I build up the values that are based on gender equality, are based on my, on my existence in order to be equal with anyone, to my dignity that I need. So these common values create a lot of tension about women and pressures of women. How much women have been attacked to her cyberbullying, for example, and this is so trendy. And I wanted to say that women are not only threatened today on their, on their personal issues or only in persons, but also their families. How many women have lost, for example, their sons or one of the family members because of their work on human rights? So I, I guess like the, all these challenges, and if we t go to another level, take the region and how much we have faced war and armed conflict in the region. And I mean, the community is in general looking at women as like victims of war. But if you come in reality, you can see that women have been champions of building peace and democracy. They have been on the front line of building pieces, of transferring communities into more inclusive community. So this is why we need to be together. This is why we don't want to imagine any kind of the world or any kind of region or any kind of societies or even families inside our houses or working condition where gender roles are not respected. We want a world that is really based on equitable uh, uh, rights, on inclusive rights. And I want to use the slogan for this year to break the bias and being like all together towards really that vision that we really need. Thank you so much. And I'm happy to hear from others so we can also have into more discussion. Thank you, Asma. Thank you, Khulud. That was a very, very positive intervention. Thank you so much. Um, after Khulud, we'll give the floor to Christina Rendon, who is a program officer for human rights defenders at the Martin Ennals Foundation. Um, between 2013 and 2019, Christina developed the advocacy strategy for women's rights at the Lutheran World uh, Federation and created a training program in human rights with a gender perspective in partnership with several organizations. She interacted for several years with the CEDAW com committee through the support 
to grassroots women's networks preparing shadow reports on women's rights in a number of countries. Christina was also actively involved in consultations with a special rapporteur on freedom of religion and belief with regards to gender equality. Here you go, Christina. Thank you very much, Asma, for the introduction, for the invitation, for, for having me today with you today. So I'm representing the Martin Ennals Foundation. Um, the Martin Ennals Foundation runs an award to human rights defenders since 30 years and is from this space and context that I will speak. And I'm so thankful that I have to speak after the wonderful intervention of Hulud because I mean, you raised several points that I, I would like to, 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 to pick up to, to start. Um, so to the question, how we really um, raise the voice of, of uh, uh, women human rights defenders to build a community. I think what you mentioned is very important is to give visibility and recognition to the work of women and contributions of women to challenge this narrative of women as recipients of aid, as victims of conflict. I mean, where are the narratives of the women building up community, challenging in speaking through to power. And I have two examples from our former laureates. One is, uh, is uh, Lujain Al-Halul, uh, who questioned uh, 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 cultural practices that are truly damaging to women, like the male guardianship, um, and paid uh, a high price for that. And Cezanne Ngabe, who uh, was a South African activist who unfortunately passed away, and dedicated her life to support women who was who were dispossessed from their lands by the community leaders. After interpreting laws in the way that was, as Hulu rightly said, damaging and discriminatory to women. So I think these women need to be supported, given visibility. We need to memorize their names. And, and show their names. We need to, to recognize their work. They need to be funded and protected. The feminist work can't be done without resources. I mean, we, we, we put all our hearts and our, our willpower in it, but in the end, we need resources. So I would like to start by that. Regarding main legal and policy gaps uh, that prevent women from fully obtaining their rights, I think one of the ma major obstacles is the lack of implementation. Regulations are there. We don't need more uh, international standards. And most of the national regulations are wonderful and beautiful and in the paper aligned with international standards. What happens? That they are hardly implemented. So take, for example, the CEDAW Convention, the, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. It's wonderful if it were respected. So there will be no child marriage, there will be no violence against women, there will be no pay gaps. The problem is implementation. So again, taking our governments accountable for the agreements they have signed and committed to respect is essential. In this uh, um, international and, and national regulations, um, there is also, uh, the, the important message that what happens in the private sphere is also the responsibility of the state. Protecting women human rights doesn't stop at the, at the door of our households or, or our workplaces. So I think it's very important to, to be reminded of, of that. And um, regarding um, actions that can be carried out to promote women's rights on a societal and cultural levels. I think um, there are uh, numerous NGOs and institutions working towards something very fundamental and is ensure that girls and women lives are valued in the same ways as boys and men's lives. So that the life and experience of women have the same, exactly the same value. So if this, uh, if we operated under this understanding, there, I mean, many expressions of poverty, violence against women, 
will be overcome. So I think this is important. I will again highlight something that Hulud mentioned because I think it's worth saying it twice. We need to call the things, uh, and, and I think it was Hulud and, and also Ingrid that mentioned, call the things for, for where they are. Attacks against uh, women uh, are not simply passional crimes or domestic violence. This is, these are femicides. If unfortunately, unfortunately, the lives of women uh, are, are gone. I mean, so we, we need really to, to, to name these crimes for what they are and ensure that uh, there is accountability and zero impunity to this. And my last point regarding uh, contributions from the society and cultural spaces um, is the impact of religious traditions as a key action to reach gender justice at, at, at the society level. There are no, no um, religious beliefs, no uh, confessions that have fully achieved gender justice. No. I mean, in, across the, the, the creeds, regions, and, 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 and confessions. But they, there are religious leaders, feminist theologists, scholars, institutions that have promoted gender sensitive reinterpretations of the religious texts that do not harm women. And I think this is truly transformative and, 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 and important. So the day our religious leaders are um, have the courage to say out loud and loud, in my, uh, in, in my religious space, I tolerate zero violence against women and girls. I won't bless any marriage where a child is involved. That day we will have a change because in many contexts, they are, are, are truly listened to. So I think I'll stop here to continue the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Christina from Martin Annals uh, Foundation. Uh, I totally have trust uh, in your experience as you have been actively involved, as I said, in consultation with the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion and Belief and uh, in regards to gender equality. So uh, we, are, we are with you in whatever you said. Uh, there is absolutely no doubt in, in, in calling these uh, violations of, of uh, human rights and women's rights uh, in specific. Uh, thank you, Christina. We move now to Rayhan uh, Baydemir, who was born in Diyarbakir in Turkey and is a Kurdish lawyer and human rights defender, providing pro bono legal assistance to the victims of human rights violations before the domestic courts. She herself was subjected to many judicial prosecution uh, due to her human rights activities. Uh, she is member of um, the Honorary uh, Board of Human Rights Association since 2008 and member of the Executive Committee of the euro Mediterranean uh, Human Rights Network and also member of the Foundation for Social and Legal Studies and vice president of the International Federation for Human Rights and founder of Women Platform for Women. Here you go, Rehan. Thank you. <clears throat> Asma, thank you, my friends. Yes, uh, first of all, I would like to thank Bahrain the Center for Human Rights and our friends who organized such important event. I'm really very happy to meet all of you here. And happy International Women's Day to all of you, all the women activists around the world who keep on struggling every day for the more justice and equal society for humanity. Uh, yes, yesterday it was 8 March. Uh, even for one day, many states did not bear to listen to the demands of women. And in many countries, such as Turkey, police attacked the women who wanted to attend the demonstration. Women demonstration was banned by the governor in Istanbul, and thousands of women were banned to attend the assembly. They were attacked and they were detained. As you know, Turkey withdrew the Istanbul Convention, the Treaty on Preventing Violence Against Women last year. The convention process achieved with hundreds of thousands of women's efforts and also on the grounds of losses, many women 
Just one of the stone of the kilometers in Istanbul Convention's path was the judgment of the European Court of Human Rights in Opus versus Turkey case and big struggle of women who stood up against the killings of them. Since then, taking into consideration what has been changed after 2011, in which Turkey was the first country to sign the convention, the convention has been a focus on the backlash against women's rights in countries with right-wing populist governments. Such governments forces women to go home back and do their duties which are being decided by patriarchy. The withdrawal of Turkey gives a lot of messages to the society and right-wing populist governments which clarifies their main aim of creating a sacred family and a sacred society replaced by women's main, main rights. As half of the world, the women pay the price for, of the consequences of policies of patriarchal states as the signatories of the wars, occupations, conflicts are all men, like many of you now raised in here. At the beginning of 21st century, extremist groups committed crimes against humanity in many parts of the world. Yes, the genocide was committed by IS in Sinjar. Thousands of women were held in captivity after the genocide. And I'm also one of the uh, founder of this women platform for struggle for women who are still in captivity by the extremist groups in the area. Uh, and let's Give an example of Nigeria. In Nigeria, mass abductions, including the kidnapping of thousands of school girls, are a black stain of this history. After the delivery of Afghanistan to Taliban, our sisters were killed and their life to right is still under real risk. This is a real femicide in front of the world, and let's say in front of the eyes of the big and powerful states. Uh, I don't want to take much time. However, today, once again, uh, I would like to underline what we have to do as women's rights activists. What we need to do, uh, what must be our priorities and how can we increase our voices to be heard against war policies, violence policies of states and uh, look what's going on in, in Ukraine, for example. Maybe today it is Ukraine, tomorrow they have another plans for another parts of the world because these policymakers are authoritarian regimes as Hulud say, said a few minutes ago. We have to reach new ways to stop all kinds of violence against women. But behind of us, we have tens of centuries which are full of injustice events but at the same time, struggle of brave women. As the women of 21st century, we never accept inequality, injustice and occupations. We reject a role such as a victim. We never accept this definition. We have big experiences, those will give light our roads. Each of us is giving struggle for human, human rights, for a fair next future of young generation, for gender equality, which means our efforts are more powerful than the war practices of men, more powerful than the male perpetrators. In Turkey, Kurdish female commerce are behind bars. Kurdish MPs are behind bars. Women political prisoners are more than male ones as the state is impatient of the women's struggle. They are the first target because they build co-chair system in politics. They insist to be main actors in policymaking process. And 10 years ago, they start to demand women quota in elected positions or executive boards of the political parties. But today, the system they uh, build is co-chair system. So today, they are the most represented in the parliament. These women behind bars or out continues to inspire women movements all over the world. In Kurdish, there is a definition we, we call as Jin Jian Azadi, means women, life, freedom. At the beginning, only Kurdish uh, women uh, shouted these slogans, but then 
This inspired the other uh, women movements in Turkey. So the others also started to use this slogan. But for a few years, we are uh, observing that in many parts of, of the world, this slogan is a common slogan. So as Hulud, as the other friends, as all of you here express, uh, solidarity means many things. To become together means everything. And today the most active opposite movement is women movement everywhere. So let's keep in believing a much better world will be created by women. We will never accept a life against human honor. We are stronger together. So keep hands tight, my friends. And thank you very much for your time, for your efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Rehan. It's astonishing how women stand for women, right? So it's it's really amazing. I love this energy. Um, sometimes it's it's quite hard when the state already lack uh, policies and laws, as you all said, to defend a woman's right. And then there is the state and then there is the society that comes and puts hands in hands with the state's against uh, women and against their rights and they put names and labels and definition on women's role uh, where women should be what women should should be uh, should be doing um so uh, i think that i always said that the the work for women's human rights it's the work for human rights in general is hard. But then if you want to work for women's human rights, you have to do double the work. You have it's even it's even harder uh, because you have to justify you have to justify to the society sometimes. So it's it's quite uh, difficult. But I, I was happy to hear uh, your intervention, Rehan. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was very positive. Um, we have um, almost like 16 minutes to finish our event. So um, I would like to ask each of you to make final remarks on, on the subject. Um, and if you have, if you have a, a positive experience working uh, in women, human rights, a, a success story, something that you would like to share to keep this event uh, hopeful, and um, optimistic, um, uh, we would like to hear that. So we will go in the same order as we started. So, Sara, here you go. <laughs> um, thank you, uh, Asma, and thank you, everyone, for like really interesting thoughts and remarks. I mean, you know, I mean, as a coalition, I think it's very important for us to always highlight and say that there is, um, you know, we have to be as careful as possible when we talk about women's rights and we talk about women human rights defenders, right? And we talk about how um, societal, in addition to like legal uh, obstacles, in addition to, you know, the power dynamics, the, the socioeconomic system, the relationship to like global powers, all of these things, how all of the mixture of all of these things affect who we are and what we do. I think this is very important. I think something that is really important for us to highlight is that in the coalition, because we say we do human rights work, we defend, or we are a group of women human rights defenders, but we are a feminist coalition, which means that we do examine power dynamics, uh, positionality, intersectionality, race, class, and uh, our relationship to each other and what is usually uh, not visibilized in our women's rights uh, discourses. And to think about it and learn from it, I think it's very important that women feminist, uh, women human rights organizations, um, people from the LGBTQ community, feminists, everyone who is working from that direction to realize these few past years also having the alternative right or the anti-right also agenda at us. This is some, something that needs absolutely important and crucial organizing. Uh, we have to always remember that not, if you do not start at local, um, it's very hard to sustain your regional and international work. So this is why also we always say we are a regional coalition that is deeply rooted in a feminist grassroots uh, movements in the MENA. So this is really, really important. And the last thing I wanted to share is that we really do have to understand that uh, 
in our work as uh, or when we say we work with WHRDs, we're also including people that do not identify as women. Uh, but but they you know but they fall in the wide wide spectrum. This is very important, and in a way, that our region is really witnessing a severe shift in terms of our feminist discourses. A few years ago, uh, nobody contested sexual violence within safe circles of uh, the civil society. Right now, in our region, we have brave feminists, brave WHRDs, speaking up against sexual uh, harassment, but also violence within civil society spaces, which I think is very important to do because if our spaces that you work with are not safe, you know, we, we can, you know, we cannot really be shocked that the greater society is not safe. So this is also very important and it does say something about the kind of shift that feminists and WHR are used doing in the manner. As for a success, you know, unfortunately, since we established this coalition, I wish that I want to say that we have a success, but what I can say is that I am humbled and honored that I do get to work in a coalition where uh, not only it is regional and embedded in feminist, uh, local feminist groups, but also that, you know, we have survived. Uh, we have survived against the odds of actually sustaining a coalition. And this is very important. There is, you know, like global economic and, you know, all of these powers that are against women organizing and being in solidarity. So I think also for us, I feel, I don't want to say we are a success story, but I'm saying despite the hard work and at some points the fear, I'm really just happy that our coalition is able to survive with minimum damage. Uh, this really crazy, crazy world that we are living in, which also give because of COVID, everyone feels fragmented. I don't have time to highlight it, but also we have to understand well-being and well-being in terms of our activism, not only mental health, but also how does our work affect us and how safe is our environments and our movements. But I feel hopeful because brilliant, brilliant, brilliant activism is happening in the manner innovative, fierce, uh, really like feminist resistance, like really so, but it's so um, humbling. So I feel that we should all just, you know, kind of, you know, stand behind it. So thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. That was a success story, huh? So don't be over humble. That's that's a success story. <laughs> um, just in case um, the, um, it, the introduction of Sarah it didn't happen in the beginning of the live streaming. So Sarah Abu Ghazal is a Palestinian writer and the regional coordinator for the Women Human Rights Defender, uh, the Middle East and North Africa Coalition. Um, thank you, Sarah, for, for your final remark. We will move now to Ingrid. Thank you, Asma. It's really interesting listening to all of you. Uh, I think, uh, Christina, you made the point of challenging the narratives. Uh, and I want to say that we can uh, to even take it further. I think it's so important to challenge the narratives, but also take the power to identify our own narratives and, and make also to, to, to highlight the inclusivity of the movement that we are living in from talking about this uh, survivor, going from the survivor to, but also in LGBTQ, I, I, IQ and, and trans women to, to have the identification uh, and power to identify yourself in the movement. Uh, and I also want to touch on some things that Sara said. Uh, I think the importance of also how to support women in rights offenders uh, in, in well-being and, and be creative uh, and tailoring uh, different support mechanisms for women in rights offenders, because it's actually also with the extremely uh, harassive uh, environment that women human rights defenders are living in, it's just, it's its actually a success to keep going uh, because that's not a given uh, with everything that they are targeted with. So, so we'll be able to support them. But I think also to for our donors to tell them that we need to be creative in the way that we support women human rights defenders because there are so many specific ways that we we are giving support but we need to be more inclusive in this way and and that also goes for all the different ident identifications of who women human rights defenders are because you can't have one support doesn't fit everyone 
So I think that's something that our donors also should. And also in, in the way that we talk about this at, at the UN level, that we need to be more inclusive in the way that we talk about support for women human rights defenders. But I think that's a massive, uh, massive uh, success that women human rights defenders can continue going uh, in their work and, and keep on despite everything, uh, the pandemic and, and also being isolated from the pandemic, but civic uh, society that has been challenged and shrinking. Uh, and I think also, to, to be able to keep this movement going. And one example that uh, the Intersectional Feminist Collective that we are supporting did uh, in Sudan, for example, just one specific example of a success story is that there was this uh, Sudanese young woman who had been uh, entered into a marriage where she was sexually abused uh, and targeted. And, and uh, after experiencing several uh, violations of her body. She, she, uh, she, uh, in self-defense, uh, killed her husband, uh, and she had a death sentence uh, hanging on her. And and uh, together with the Intersectional Feminist Collective, with our uh, grassroots activists on ground, and 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 together with big uh, international organizations, we managed to change that sentence into uh, having a prison sentence for three years. So so it serves to show that pressure helps. We can even change sentences, uh, and but we need to do it together. Uh, and coming together from cross-regional networks like that, uh, and we have great power. So not only keep going, but also there are things that we can do together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ingrid, for emphasizing on the solidarity and the network we share between ourselves to change, even if it was the slightest uh, realities of of those uh, who are being touched by those uh, violations. Thank you, Ingrid. Uh, Khuloud, here you go. Thank you. Thank you, Asma. Thank you so much. Um, yes, I want to start from Ingrid. I still remember Noura. You're talking about Noura in Sudan, where they had all these movements towards Noura. And this is the importance when, when the, the sharing of personal stories when we look at, at like as as defenders and activists, not like numbers, but stories, like to shed their story, to make their story global, this is very important. The uniqueness and the impact of of, of all these stories. Actually, as as I've said before, like we are like the world is a split around us. Yes, we feel a lot of targets. The closure of civic spaces. We face a, a lot of uh, now under the uh, the the countering measures of terrorism. How much activists are characterized as being against regimes. So all of these uh, challenging communities we're really facing. But on the on the other side, um, we're there. We're there with solidarity together. We're there with our stories. We're there with our visions. We're there with our beliefs. We're there with our like uh, bringing on the table or the, our points of strength, and this is very important. I like the idea, I double the idea of Christina, that we make our own narratives. And I think Ingrid also highlights, yes, we make our own narratives and we create the zone that we really work about it. Uh, and I guess like one of the most important tools that might be needed is how we raise education and culture on human rights. Because if we go in all the sectors we've been raised in families, in general, I'm talking in general, in families, in schools, in university, there is total absence for the culture of human rights, whether it's about it's really knowing or how you bring it into, into practice and into a behavior. So reaching out for, for, for people to believe in your cause and to believe in, 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 in your missions for, for, for human rights, for the sake of for human rights in general, this is something very important because it widens the circle and it brings people to be more advocates. And this also could, could create a very important tool, to, uh, points of strength towards women rights defenders. And I guess like what makes us now a successful story is, is not really, I know what put it in terms of successful stories, but as long as we're there with all the challenges, preserving in our beliefs, putting our hands together and, um, and taking care of, of our self-care, of our psychic, um, uh, psychic, psychological, and all the other is, is something very important. When we learn to love ourselves, to love our work, to push forward with our work, there is one 
thing I want to highlight at the end, there was an initiative during COVID when the whole world closed. Uh, we've worked on establishing a mobile application that raises awareness on women rights in Lebanon. And that was the idea of bringing innovation and creativity into the, uh, the culture of raising awareness. So we managed during the COVID to, um, to, to build this app. And this app has, has been now been spreading to many youth. And they are doing initiatives. They are understanding more and more, not in, in a formal context. So I guess like um, going into more creative tools that are needed today, uh, taking technology as an important asset is like um, is an important tool that we can work on. Thank you. Thank you, Khulud. Well said. We're running out of time, so let's catch up with Christina. Um, I will summarize my, my, my narratives for hope in three aspects. One is the very, the very resistance and persistence of women human rights defenders in spite of attacks, in spite of harassment. It's, it's, it's really wonderful and meaningful to, to see how um, all these um, threats have not been able to stop. The, the movement. So I think this is a sign of, of hope. Uh, of course, it can go on. I mean, it, something has to be done at the structural way so that it stops. But it means that the, the, the willpower and the, 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 the force and strength of the movement uh, goes beyond the threats. The second point is, um, I think the understanding of many uh, actors in the human rights movement that we cannot continue um, preaching to the choir. We need men to be on board this discussion. I will be curious to see how many are following this debate today on, 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 on the social media platforms, because I think um, it's important that this person crosses the bridge from feminist uh, and women's movements to, um, to men. And my third and last um, sign for hope uh, lies with the young generation. We are in the new days uh, in the middle of the uh, Human Rights Room and Film Festival, and I have been able to watch so many wonderful movies uh, produced by women that highlight this uh, intersectionality that was mentioned in, in this uh, panel that Ingrid uh, spoke about, and that highlight their own experiences with their own voices. So writers, poets, uh, movie makers, singers, I think the, the young generation has incorporated the need to talk uh, from their own experience. So I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christina. Rayhan. Yeah, when I was listening, Ingrid, uh, I remembered a lot of cases that we touched the lives of women when we uh, brought their cases before the European Court of Human Rights during the 90s, for example. If uh, you change someone's life, so this means many things, not only individual. This is not an individual case, for example. This also inspired the uh, activism. This also inspired to believe in struggle. Uh, I was very young lawyer when I started to represent very uh, serious victims of violations during 90s in my uh, city. So the cases were related to rape under custody, uh, torture, disappearances uh, during custodies. I mean, um, forceful evacuations of, of the villages uh, and killings, mass graves, etc. So we were only very, very few young lawyers. And also it was again a state under emergency situation. So the my association always was closed down by the state uh, every month. So in a very small law office, we uh, decided to bring these cases before the European Court of Human Rights. So this is a history. It is over there. There are a lot of hundreds of judgments of European court. Before, if, if we didn't bring, 
Maybe we will only uh, tell the stories, etc. So someone believed in and someone uh, refused to believe what's going on. And these crimes were against humanity, for example. But later on, um, I think a, a, a kind of new legislation has been written by Kurdish lawyers, but also uh, it gave a life light light to the other struggles in, in many parts of the world. Uh, so uh, we don't have any time. I have to stop here. But uh, lastly, uh, the Christian told it was the same that I'm going to tell. Uh, we have to reach young generation. They are very, uh, I mean, uh, positive. They have energy, but also they need hope. Sometimes these anti-democratic states authoritarian regimes unfortunately they kill the hope itself now in my country every single day young people suiciding or they are uh, leaving the country they are becoming refugees etc etc because there there is no hope if in a country the hope is being killed this point we may lose my